Hello everyone, welcome to another video of mine. In this video, I have covered the causes of vocal cord paralysis and the consequences of those paralysis. To understand this video, you have to watch my previous video which is on my channel. I'll link it down below. In this slide, you can see the route taken by the superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve, both right and left side. As you can see that the left recurrent laryngeal nerve takes a more complicated pathway as compared to the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. Left recurrent laryngeal nerve arises from the level of aorta in the mediastinum and it loops around the arch of aorta before ascending into the neck in the tracheoesophageal groove. This is a more clear illustration of the route taken by the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Since it covers a long path in the mediastinum it is prone to more damage as compared to the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. The way I remember this piece of information is that I remembered that the left recurrent laryngeal nerve starts with an L and since it starts with an L, it is longer than the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. It works for me. This is the classification of the laryngeal paralysis. Paralysis can either be unilateral or bilateral. It can either be of recurrent laryngeal nerve or superior laryngeal nerve or both. If you have already seen my previous video, it should be very easy for you to understand the consequences of the paralysis of each nerve, whether it's unilateral or bilateral. The unilateral paralysis of recurrent laryngeal nerve, whether right or left, causes ipsilateral paralysis of intrinsic muscles except cricothyroid. Because the cricothyroid muscle is supplied by the superior laryngeal nerve, so it is saved in this paralysis. The vocal cord assumes a median or paramedian position. It is mainly asymptomatic. Why? Because the healthy vocal cord compensates for it and crosses the midline to meet the paralyzed cord. Thus, the normal functions of vocal cord can be maintained. So a patient with only one functional or healthy vocal cord can go undetected. There may be some change in voice, but no aspiration or airway obstruction. If there is a bilateral paralysis, this is the paralysis of the muscles of both sides except cricothyroid. Both cords lie in a median or a paramedian position. Dyspnea and strider is seen because the airway is inadequate. The dyspnea and strider becomes worse on exertion or during an attack of acute laryngitis. If there is unilateral paralysis of superior laryngeal nerve, only the ipsilateral paralysis of cricothyroid will be seen since superior laryngeal nerve is mainly a sensory nerve. Ipsilateral anesthesia of larynx above the vocal cords will be noticed. The voice will be weak, the pitch cannot be raised and there will be occasional aspiration. Bilateral paralysis of superior laryngeal nerve paralyzes both the cricothyroid muscles. Anesthesia of upper larynx is seen and the voice is hoarse and there can be aspiration which leads to choking fits. Many a times there are combined paralysis means the paralysis of both the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the superior laryngeal nerve. If there is unilateral combined paralysis, there is paralysis of all the muscles on one side except interarytenoid because interarytenoid receives an innervation from opposite side. The vocal cord will be in cadaveric position, the voice will be hoarse, there can be aspiration and the cuff will be ineffective. Combined bilateral paralysis will paralyze all the muscles of the larynx. Both of the vocal cords will be in cadaveric position and there will be complete anesthesia of the larynx. Aphonia, aspiration and complications such as bronchopneumonia due to repeated aspiration can be seen. This slide illustrates the various positions of the vocal cord, median, paramedian, cadaveric, and adducted vocal cord. The causes of laryngeal paralysis may be supranuclear, nuclear, high vagal, low vagal, systemic, or idiopathic. But in this slide, we will discuss the characteristic causes of each paralysis. Only the characteristic associations are tested on the exam, so the students must know these characteristic causes. Bronchogenic carcinoma, aortic aneurysm, mediastinal lymph adenopathy. These conditions are characteristically associated with the paralysis of left recurrent laryngeal nerve. 
Meanwhile, the mention of thyroid surgery such as thyroidectomy, carcinoma of thyroid, cancer of cervical esophagus, and right lung apex carcinoma in a clinical scenario denotes right recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis. Thyroidectomy, carcinoma of thyroid, and the cancer of cervical esophagus is also the cause of bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis. The examiners love mentioning thyroidectomy in their clinical scenarios to denote recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis. Thyroidectomy, diphtheria, neuritis, and cervical nodes involvement denotes superior laryngeal nerve paralysis. And Thyroidectomy or any cancer or infection in medulla, posterior, cranial fossa, jugular foramen, and parapharyngeal space denotes combined paralysis of both the superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. To understand the etiology and causes of the paralysis of these nerves, you have to understand their roots and memorize them. As you can see that the right recurrent laryngeal nerve arises at the level of the subclavian artery and loops around it. So an aneurysm of subclavian artery denotes right recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis. Meanwhile, an aneurysm at the arch of the aorta is more likely to cause damage to the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. So you have to really understand the anatomy and the roots taken by these nerves to understand their etiology. Hopefully it's clear to you now since it's a very tested topic on the exams. Thank you so much for watching my video. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. And if you have any queries or suggestions, please drop down your comments and I'll get back to you. Thank you.